Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. Just bear with me today. Uh, you know, we all have the thing that happens to us once a year. So I sound like I'm in a, I feel like I sound like I'm in a tunnel. So if I, my voice is a little lower, uh, just bear with me today. I'll try not to sneeze very much. Um, I wanted to remind you about tonight because this is going to be a really good thing for our congregation. Our kids are going to be putting on just, it's going to be a great show. So I just encourage all of you, even if you don't have any kids or grandkids in, in this group, come and support them. This is what we do as family. We support each other and they will do a great show for you. Um, it's an exciting time, so I encourage you to come uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we are in the middle of our Advent series, and uh, I'm just so glad you're all here. If you're watching us online, thank you so much. I know that there are several of you that are not necessarily in San Angelo. You're all over, and uh, we are very thankful that you're watching, and I hope this is helpful to you. Uh, but if you're in town, come. It's always better to be in person. Uh, people here are really nice, and I think you'd like them. Um, but we're today talking about joy, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But I wanted to begin with a story. Uh, about a man that uh, I think will hopefully inspire you. He is a uh, Texas native. He's actually from Henderson, Texas. His name is uh, Robert Taylor. Now, in World War II, right before it started, he had gotten married and decided to join the military, join the army specifically. His assignment uh, was in the Philippines. Uh, unfortunately, about a year into his service, his entire, I don't know if it's a battalion or what, but they all surrendered. And it was, MacArthur didn't want it, but he had to leave, and it was just a very bad time. I think there were about 75,000 soldiers, both American and Filipino, were captured. And he actually was, uh, would spend the next three years or so in Japanese POW camps. He actually uh, spent time on the Bataan Death March. Uh, he experienced horrific treatment at the hands of his captors. He would go on to see some very close friends get sick and die. Um, some simply just losing the will to live. One man, a colonel, you would think colonels would be a little bit more resolute, but who knows in that situation what, what those conditions do to people. He says his, this one colonel simply told him one day, he said, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. It's not worth it. I'm tired of fighting. And he said he laid down, turned on his side, and within five minutes the man was dead. He simply lost the will to live. But Taylor never stopped encouraging his soldiers. At one, at one point, he was uh, caught smuggling medicine uh, to uh, some sick soldiers in his little camp there. And uh, they, um, well, they caught him. See, it was, it was difficult back then because they withheld medicine. And so if you were in one of these hospitals in, the, in, this, in this camp, the average uh, life expectancy once you entered this hospital was about 19 days. So he didn't like that. He found a way to get some medicine and he smuggled it in and the people started getting better. Well, he was eventually caught and he was sentenced to a Japanese hot box. It's a four by five foot cell that meant certain death. But he survived. After nine weeks, he stayed in there for nine weeks, sweltering heat. Four by five. He was released, and uh, as he as he uh, came out of his cell, um, he emerged stinking, rotting teeth, using a cane. But the first words were encouragement to his men to choose life, choose to live. Then he was crammed into a transport ship, where a lot of soldiers were. At one point, there were sixteen hundred. Soldiers crammed into these transport ships. You know, bombers mistook them for warships and would bomb them. People died. They tried to swim to the shore, they would get shot. It was horrific, horrific conditions. Even after he experienced that, even after seeing friends die, even after going from 170 pounds, strong man down to 75 pounds, basically skin and bones, he continued to encourage the men, telling them that he was not going to die because he had hope. God was with him. He was choosing life and he wanted them to choose life too. So he finally returns home after four and a half years uh, away and he was met by his wife who didn't really seem that 
that happy to see him. In fact, she seemed a little distressed. Uh, and although she held out hope that he was alive, some uh, higher ups told her that he had died. And so five months prior to him getting back, she had remarried. He was devastated. But he let her go. He told her, I love you. And he says his own words, you're still a great gal. But he felt abandoned by God. But he would soon realize that God was with him by his side and had never left. So he chose to move forward. He stayed in the service. He remarried. Was eventually promoted to major general. And throughout his life, throughout the difficulties, throughout the uh, imprisonment, he would have several choices to make. But his choice would always be life and hope and joy. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about how to choose joy. I mean, it is a joyous season after all, isn't it? Well, unless you're in conflict, unless you're in trouble, unless you're in a mess, unless you aren't able to make ends meet, unless you lose everything in a tornado. I mean, life is joyous, could be, except for those things, some would say. I mean, Lord, come quickly, am I right? For many, the seasons don't make much different to our circumstances. But I believe we can still have joy. I believe we could even expect it. So today we're going to talk about how. We're going to be in two places, Luke chapter 3 and then Philippians chapter 4. But first, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up these people today. Lord, who are struggling to make sense of things, who are struggling to make sense of tragedy. Lord, whether it's natural, whether it's man-made, we lift up those people who are losing the will to keep going. Some of them might even be in this room. Lord, we lift up those people in this room who are giving in to anger and giving in to frustration and sadness, Lord. I pray that you would encourage them this morning with your word. Help us know without a doubt that your spirit is here that you want to give us hope, peace, and joy. So today, Lord, we enter into this time of listening and engaging with your word. We offer you our full attention, and we promise, Lord, not to simply absorb it, but to put it into practice. And today, Lord, we eagerly anticipate hearing from you, and we are planning to wrestle with your word. And we are seeking to draw closer to you, Lord. You have brought us into safety into the beginning of this day. So please keep us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. Lord, and in all we do, direct us to fulfill your purpose through Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. So we're talking about joy today, not happiness. Do not confuse the two. I know you've heard a lot of those comparisons lately. Happiness is always about the pursuit. It's always something that's in progress. You know, um, it's, it's, it's elusive. In fact, happiness really is tied to the pursuit. And if it ever is realized, it's usually brief. Because it's based on a myriad of circumstances. If circumstances were to change, so would then our level of happiness. This is why people are always pursuing. Because life is fluid. Life is always changing. You never really know what's going to happen. What's interesting is that when happiness is our main focus, that's what we're trying to do. Find happiness. Then typically what that means is our focus is usually also on ourselves. When our focus is on ourself, then we often make choices that are good for us, but not necessarily always so good for others. I mean, really, as long as we're happy, are we really concerned with other people? Are we okay if we're happy and others aren't? I mean, happiness, it's this, it's this loop of pursuit. It's 
It's never fully realized, but it is always in motion. Joy, however, is something that cannot be pursued. It has to be chosen. It's not reliant on our circumstances or, or you know, what's necessarily in our emotional feelings box at the moment. Joy is directly connected, though, with how we choose to live, I believe. Robert Taylor chose joy. I mean, really, if you just look at his life, I think what you'll see is that to choose joy is to believe that God is with you. If we really knew God was with you, how great would So today what I want to do is talk about, a joy, talk about what a joyful life looks like. And then I want to start by talking with, with one of the most joyful characters in Scripture, John the Baptist. <laughs> yeah. John is, when you see John the Baptist, you don't just immediately think joyful, you know. But I think he has some things to say about joy. John is a larger than life character, isn't he? And we've talked about him for the past few Sundays. In Luke 3, he's uh, by the Jordan River and he's preaching this uh, sermon of uh, baptism for the forgiveness of, of sins. He's preaching repentance, and, um, which this usually means that people who are watching and listening to him are in various states of need. And a lot of people realize they need forgiveness. Of course, oftentimes when you're in your own mess, you don't realize just how messy it is. When you're in your own sin, you don't realize just how sinful we are. We usually use a certain measure uh, when, whenever we measure other people and judging other people. We are really harsh and specific with them, but when it's us, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Oh, well, I didn't mean to do it this or that. And so when we are in the midst of our own sin, it's not, we don't necessarily look at it necessarily as that bad compared to other people, that is. Of course, oftentimes... Um, you need someone to kind of help you see just how, I will say, just how necessary God is for you. You know, the Spirit will help us, but, but in this particular instance, John was around a lot of people who needed a little bit of reminding. They need a word to help them understand just how difficult uh, it was going to be if they did not change their ways. So he ensures them with words that aren't always nice uh, of just how much they need to get right with God. Sometimes he's quite frank. So let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 3 beginning in verse 7. This is what he says. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering if in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. With many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. I think that that last little verse is interesting. After calling them names, <laughs> after telling them God's wrath is coming, the ax is at the root of the tree, it says this was good news. <laughs> 
We look at it and we think, wow, that was a bit harsh. I mean, what's good about that? But if you spend some time really unpacking that text, you'll realize this is all really good news. Now, he's telling them that God is desiring repentance. We talked about that last Sunday. And, and we know that true repentance is always followed by action. You can't just say, I'm sorry, and that's it. There has to be some action. It's, it's more than just an internal, silent decision. True repentance is always followed by action. True repentance is visible. And oftentimes I think we think, well, but I go to church. I'm good. I'm involved. I'm, I give. I'm good. And John says to the Jewish people in the audience, listen, don't think just because you're Jewish, because you're a, children, a child of Abraham, that you're good. We all have choices to make. We, can, we can't ride the coattails of our father's faith for the rest of our life. At one point, we're going to have to choose our own faith to believe on our own. And this must have struck a chord with them because what follows are some practical questions from the crowd. Some interesting groups within the crowd. You know, Jews, tax collectors, soldiers. And so John's response is very clear. What does he tell them? He says, we'll give out of your excess. If someone needs a shirt and you have two, give them one. Give the excess of your food. So you can take care of someone else's needs. And he says, don't take more than you need. Don't take advantage of others for money. Be satisfied with your pay. And when they ask him what they need to do, what doesn't John say? He doesn't say anything about ritual, about temple, about sacrifice. He doesn't say anything about religion. He tells people to give, pay attention, to care for the needy to practice truth, to practice justice. This is what's going to lead to a transformed life, a focus on what is real and important to God and valuable to God. But I think sometimes we mistake religion for faith. And if we aren't paying attention, we can religion our way out of transformation. Dabbling in church attendance and participation doesn't really require much from us. Definitely doesn't require a change in behavior, but maybe for 30 minutes a, a week. So for John, this is interesting. For John, he's expecting people to behave and not just believe. And this belief, though, when you embrace it, it starts to change the way you live. It starts to change how you treat others. It changes the way you view your stuff your excess, and it changes the way you see your circumstances. Transforms your desire for more, and in reality, to begin to choose this way of life is to, to begin to choose the life that God wants for you, that He desperately wants for you, and to choose this life is to choose joy. And joy, whenever it's chosen, will always benefit others. When you choose joy, it will always benefit others. Pursuing our own happiness rarely makes things better for anyone other than ourselves. Happiness is quite self-centered. Joy, however, is mutually beneficial because it's a way that's rooted in love and it's a way that's rooted in trust and justice for all. This is why this hard word of John is good news for everybody. Because it frees us all from this pursuit of self-centeredness. Because to choose this life is to choose to love God and to love other people. But it is a choice. And sometimes for us, it is a consistent, each and every day choice. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily kind. People who are annoying. People who don't necessarily want the best for us. And our circumstances often change. And sometimes we bear the brunt of other people's frustrating pursuits of happiness, don't we? We are the ones who have to suffer from other people trying to, to get all they can to be happy for themselves. We are the ones who sometimes suffer for that. 
it's, it, it's hard to be a casualty of someone else's mistakes. And it's difficult to manage that, especially whenever we feel like we are consistently on the losing end of things. How can we be joyful when we find ourselves in the middle of these types of situations? Now, I don't believe that joy means you're always happy or even in a good mood. Sometimes choosing joy simply means not choosing hate. Let's lower the bar just a little bit. I think sometimes choosing joy is simply just not choosing to hate or to be angry, to be snide. And sometimes really honest with yourself, isn't this sometimes all we can expect from ourselves? Sometimes things are really hard. Granted, it's a low bar, but to release your anger and your hatred and your disappointment is to let these things go is to release your hands from holding on to things so that you can hold on to something else. Something that's more meaningful. Something that will actually give to you instead of take. What I find is those things that we think will make us happy are usually things that end up taking from us instead of giving. And I think to let go of those things is to let go of death and to grab a hold of, of, of joy is to choose to live. I keep a line from one of my favorite movies uh, close to me. And I've said it many times this past year in conversations to myself. Um, two prisoners are talking one has been there for a little while. Um, the other, he's facing a long, painful road ahead. And in this tender moment, Morgan Freeman's character tells this man who's been falsely accused and convicted of murder. Uh, he says, get busy living or get busy dying. I think to choose joy is to get busy living it's to trust that what God has given us is enough despite our circumstances because John is laying out this news in a very basic way it's not complicated what is he telling us to do he's telling us to repent from our self-centeredness and factor other people into the equation of our life now does, does John say anything about joy no he doesn't but I believe that he's showing us that the good news is a choice. It begins with repentance, letting go, believing that God is with you and that what he has given us is enough. And as, as, as we move into this Christmas season and this, this, this time when we're expecting all these uh, emotions and great little moments and traditional moments... My question to you is, would you like to expect something a little more than, than, than happiness? Wouldn't you like to expect something a little bit more than, than something that is brief and fleeting? And once it's over, you're left with credit card bills until the next year. Now, wouldn't you like to expect joy? If so, it doesn't begin with this pursuit. It begins with a choice. Listen to what Paul tells the Philippian church uh, in, in chapter 4. Uh, it's probably one of the most recognizable passages in Scripture, and it's very comforting to me, but it also seems a little bit hard to do. This is what he says. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul isn't telling his people to ignore the world. He's not telling his people to ignore the pain to ignore the conflict because if you read in Philippians you realize they've got all that they've got conflict they've got difficulty they've had, a, they've had a rough go in Philippi 
And were this said, of a, were this said by anyone else? Might not have been taken seriously. But Paul even had his own fair share of, of, of difficulties, didn't he? Imprisoned, beaten, left for dead, shipwrecked, rejected by his former friends and colleagues, you name it. And yet he was choosing joy over the alternative. Now, was he always happy? No, you see that and you even read that in his letters. But did he believe God was with him? No doubt. In Paul's way, always benefited other people, not just himself. Paul had to choose joy just as we have to choose it today. And thankfully, Paul chose to live, and the joy he chose to express is still benefiting us, even today. Now, Major General Robert Taylor Preston could have given up. He could have given in, but instead he chose differently. What's interesting about him is that he did not go to war with weapons or ammunition. That's not what he did. Robert Taylor Preston was a chaplain. He was probably more effective at combating the enemy than anyone who carried a sidearm. His faith, his joy were his only weapons. A few years after he returned, he was appointed chief of chaplains for the Air Force. And I think if you were to to read the stories, you'll find that his encouragement, his joy, the choices he made to survive, to live, to thrive, even in as much as they could, gave other people the will to live. Why not let go? Why not repent? Why not choose joy and expect that it will come? And the peace As Paul tells us, the peace will follow. I mean, imagine those who are going to benefit from the choices that you will make today. Imagine the people who will benefit if you chose joy over everything else. Joy is the essence of God. It is inherent in His Spirit. And I believe once you choose to turn away from your sin and embrace joy in life, then it will be good news for you and it will be good news for everyone else around you. All those people in your oikos. So my question is, how will you choose today? I'm not saying it's easy. But how will you choose today? I'm going to encourage you to choose life to choose God, to choose His Son, and accept the joy that He has to give. Because it's here. And it's knowing God will always be with you, despite our circumstances. And I will say, if you haven't chosen to follow Christ, today's the day. You may not get another chance to choose, y'all. Do you know how short life is? Yes, we're looking towards a great moment we're going to have in a couple weeks, but so were a lot of people two days ago. You've got a chance to turn everything around. How will you choose today? By the way, the water's warm. So if you need to get baptized, if you want to give it all right now, I'm ready for you. And so is God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for these people. You have given everything. Lord, some people who have given their life to you, some people who have given their time just to be here today, Lord, I pray that it is not wasted. I pray that there are people here who have walked in this morning really unsure of what they were going to encounter, probably even now are resistant to making this choice because they don't really know what it's going to mean. I pray that you would break down those walls. I pray that you would help them, Lord, to just give it up. And to know that you, your way, is the way to life. And everything else is just going to take. Help us to choose. To choose well. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, our elders and staff and uh, some of our spouses are going to be in the room. Please take a moment and find someone and pray. Let's all stand together and sing.